Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, research exchange. Uh, and now that you all got your uh, sandwiches, we should thank uh, Infineon uh, for supporting the uh, seminars and providing the lunch. Uh, and uh, before I introduce uh, the uh, speaker today, uh, I also like to mention that we have a special seminar uh, next uh, Tuesday at uh, 4 p.m. So this is not the usual time. Uh, the speaker will be uh, Dr. Chen Gui Huang. Uh, he is a former CTO and CEO of uh, Samsung Electronics, and uh, he will be uh, talking to us about uh, his vision of uh, future technologies. And uh, you will be uh, also here, and welcome to attend this uh, seminar. Uh, and there are also flyers uh, in the back about our new i4e series uh, seminar on Friday, uh, and uh, you're welcome to attend. And uh, uh, today, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Alex Zettel. Uh, Professor Zettel received his uh, uh, bachelor degree uh, here from Berkeley in 1978, uh, went to UCLA for his uh, PhD, and upon completing his PhD in 1983, uh, he joined the uh, faculty here and is currently a professor in the physics department as well as a senior scientist uh, at uh, Lawrence uh, Berkeley Lab. He's also a director of uh, NSF Center, COIN, as shown here on his slide. This is a, a, a nanoscale um, engineering and science uh, uh, center that, uh, uh, head, that's headquartered at Berkeley. Uh, team members also include um, Stanford, Caltech, and uh, uh, UC Merced. Uh, Professor Zeto is very well known for his pioneering work uh, in carbon nanotubes, and particularly its uh, nano uh, electromechanical uh, properties. Uh, I believe uh, most of you probably have all heard about uh, this uh, single carbon nanotube radio uh, playing uh, vibrations. Uh, it was uh, broadcast uh, in uh, uh, radio stations uh, uh, not too long ago. So uh, today he's going to tell us uh, even newer things beyond these uh, uh, nano electromechanical radios. Let's welcome uh, Professor Zetto. Thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here and address this crowd. I, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, research exchange for uh, providing that opportunity for me. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, a famous theoretical physicist uh, who had just won the Nobel Prize. And so a lot of reporters went up to him and said, tell us what the, uh, the most important problems in physics are right now. And his response was, well, let me tell you what I'm working on right now. And uh, so I have, uh, as my title, some advances in nanotechnology at Berkeley. And Berkeley is really a hub of a lot of exciting nanoscience and nanotechnology research. And I'm, I'm not going to do a survey of all that. Um, what I'm going to do is just uh, pick a few things that are from my own laboratory that I am excited about and uh, hope to share some of that, some of that with you. So here are some challenges. And uh, I'm interested in, in making small machines at the uh, molecular scale. And so one interesting thing would be to make a, uh, a sort of an energy converter, take electric energy and convert it to mechanical motion, so electric motors. And let's see how small we can make electric motors and still have them function. And then maybe uh, uh, to solve energy concerns and fossil fuel depletions and so on, uh, to have something that converts sunlight to energy, and of course we know about photovoltaics and, and other things, but maybe we can have sort of an, an interesting system that does that perhaps more efficiently, certainly in a, in a simpler way. And at the end, um, I'll talk about uh, radio transmission and, and pushing that to the molecular scale. So one uh, important aspect of working with uh, sort of machinery, uh, for example electric motors, is the tools you need to manipulate, to build these things, to manipulate them scales with motor size. And if you have this relatively large electric motor here, a couple of meters in size, if you want to move that around, uh, you need a forklift, basically. And if you want to operate that, take it apart, fix it, you need wrenches on the order of a meter long or so. So that's sort of macroscopic scale. And then you want to go smaller and smaller, say, by an order of magnitude. You've got this motor here, kind of thing you might have on a table saw. 
And you're going to work on that. You can put that in your lap and work on it, work on it with some pliers and so on. And you go a little bit smaller, around a centimeter, you're going to start using uh, small tweezers to work on that. So the question is, if we want to go smaller and smaller, what tools do we have available? And pretty soon, you realize these kinds of mechanical manipulation tools that we can hold in our hand stop working. And you need other techniques. You might need other materials. Maybe you don't want to use metal, steel here, but you might want to use other materials that lend themselves to other forms of manipulation. And so there was a dramatic breakthrough in making very small motors here at Berkeley by uh, Richard Muller in the EECS department. And I think this is a fantastic achievement. He made this rotational motor that was, uh, you know, orders of magnitude smaller than, than other, other motors that had been made before. And he borrowed techniques from the semiconductor industry, the electronics industry, to, to be able to use silicon and use various lithographic techniques to, to etch this and made a rotational motor. Here's the motor, the rotor of it. Here's the bearing. Here's some stators. So you put appropriate voltages on these with respect to the, uh, the rotor. And this thing spins around. And it, it really works quite nicely. And the size scale is, I've shown down here, 100 microns. And so it's, it's a micro scale. A human hair is sort of about the, the size of this, this rotor. So it's, it's, it's small. You could see it with an optical microscope. Um, so it's not really atomic scale. And so I was interested in, in, in maybe making a rotational motor like this that uh, was much smaller in the nanoscale. And the, the first thing we thought is, well, let's just stand on the shoulders of giants and take this design and just make it smaller. And we had electron beam lithography at our disposal, and we could use the same silicon materials. And we, we shrunk this down to a nanometer scale. And it was a beautiful thing. It, it looked kind of just like this because we, we didn't see any need to improve it. And it had one slight problem. That is, it didn't work at all. It was uh, totally frozen. There was no way to get that bearing to work. And we soon realized these were the wrong materials to, to be using for nanoscale motors. So we decided to explore other materials. And, and silicon is actually sort of a three-dimensional material. Here's uh, uh, the analog for, for carbon. You have a, a carbon atom bonded to these uh, close neighbors in this three-dimensional network. And for, for carbon, uh, that, that network is called diamond, which we know is very hard, very stiff. But it's, it's uh, uh, not really the best material if you're trying to make uh, bearings. And that was the problem we had, that these bearings would jam up. So you can either do this with silicon or, or, or diamond, but we decided to go more into the graphite regime where you have these very weak, weak van der Waals bonds between very strong sheets, and that can give you very low friction. So that was the idea. And of course, graphite is used as a, as a lubricant for some applications, but in other applications, like for the space shuttle, graphite actually doesn't work very well as a lubricant uh, because some people say we need a lot of oxygen and, and water around to make graphite be a good lubricant, and in a hard vacuum, it actually jams up. So that was an interesting concern. So we wanted to make something that was circular, that looked more like a bearing than, than planar, like graphite. And so uh, the concept is you take a graphene sheet, one sheet of graphite, and you conceptually roll it up into this little tube, this carbon nanotube. And that's not really the way you make carbon nanotubes. That's very complex, and nobody's ever taken a graphene sheet and rolled it into a nanotube. But it turns out if you take carbon atoms and sort of throw them in the air and get them very, very hot and cool them down very quickly, they naturally want to form this structure. It's metastable. The graphene sheet, the flat sheet, has a lower energy, and this is metastable. But diamond is metastable, too. And so when you hear a diamond is forever, that's really totally bogus. Uh, the, the slogan should be graphite is forever. And uh, a diamond is metastable. So we've got these metastable structures, but the, the activation barrier to get to the, to the lower energy state is rather high. So for all practical purposes, they're, they're stable. So we, we want to make this long tube, and uh, we can synthesize those. But for our purposes here, this so-called single wall tube is not ideal. And we want to make nested tubes, one tube inside the other, where each shell is separated from the other by these weak van der Waals bonds. But the tube fabric itself is these very strong covalent bonds, basically the strongest bonds in nature. So we can make these single wall tubes or multi wall tubes in a similar process. And so I'm going to concentrate for the moment on this multi wall tube. And if it has very few defects, the, the surfaces are very, very smooth, then in fact you can envision 
that this would form a perfect bearing where you have these nested tubes and if you grab this thing, you can slide it with little friction or perhaps even rotate it. And that would make a nanoscale bearing uh, without the possibility of uh, dirt getting in here and jamming it up because it's a perfect fit where no atom actually can fit in. It, it, it is a, 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 as close a fit as you can get atomically perfect. So we, we wanted to explore the uh, frictional uh, properties of such a nested tube. And the problem is when you get to the end of the tube, this is a high resolution transmission electron microscope image of it, um, it's, it's capped off and you don't have access to these. And that was very frustrating and I often thought, well, if I could shrink myself down to the nanoscale, I'd go in here with a hacksaw and start cutting these bonds and then manipulate things. And the problem was we didn't have the right tools to get in there and manipulate this nanostructure. We had large tools, but not tools at this scale. And so we embarked on a process to create the tools we needed, to have the eyes so we could see what we're doing, like a microscope, and then the tools, the mechanical manipulation tools, where we go in with our hands or some, some extension of our hands and manipulate this. And so the, the eyes for us were a high-resolution transmission electron microscope, and these microscopes can achieve atomic resolution. And then to manipulate things mechanically while we were watching with the transmission electron microscope, we developed these uh, other microscopes, these manipulators. It's basically a scanning tunneling microscope that fits inside the transmission electron microscope. So we built these small scanning tunneling microscopes. They were inserted into the column of the transmission electron microscope. And then we had manipulation tools and we could see what we were doing in real time. So uh, this was a, a, a wonderful breakthrough. Uh, and we were able to now open up the ends of, of nanotubes here, for example, are these caps. And just schematically, we open it up, we grab this, and we slide it around or rotate it, and we can measure frictional forces. And here, this looks like a sort of a trombone extension. Here are the core tubes, and here are the outer shells using this, uh, this microscope image. And we could slide this around or rotate it and measure friction. And the frictional forces we measured were, on a per atom basis, extremely small. In fact, those are the smallest frictional forces that have ever been measured for any two materials touching each other. So it really is ultra-low friction. In fact, this was our, our per limit, and the friction was so small we couldn't measure it. It's, it's you know, almost zero. It's not going to be completely zero. There are still some interactions there. But uh, it seems to be the ideal material to use for a bearing for this motor. So we wanted to be as simple as we could, so this was a schematic of how we might do this. Have some electrical drive plates. You can actually have a gate electrode below this, and this might be uh, silicon and silicon oxide as a sort of a mounting platform. And here's our shaft, and you can notch out some nanotubes, put a rotor here, and then maybe uh, spin this thing around. So we used electron beam lithography to, to do this, and here's one of our early motors that we fabricated. It's maybe a couple hundred nanometers across. Here's this nanotube shaft, and then if you appropriately notch out the uh, tube on either side and apply voltages, um, then you get a motor that you can spin around. And people say, well, how long can this spin around for? And we're, we're using uh, microscope time to image this, and microscope time is expensive, and so the answer is until I run out of money. That's, <laughs> that's how long it operates. So there is no apparent wear. The thing just keeps going and going and going and you can zoom in with a transmission electron microscope and every atom is in place. It doesn't ever wear out. So that's um, uh, really quite nice. I've got another video that shows um, sort of schematically how this is made. And I think I'm gonna darken the lights in the front just a little bit so we can see this better. So let me show you this, this uh, video, which was actually made by an undergraduate in my laboratory. And this shows that we sort of schematically take nanotubes, we deposit them out of solution onto silicon oxide that's on silicon. And then using electron beam lithography, uh, we can deposit gold all in one shot. So we make the, uh, the anchors, the stator plates, and the rotor in one shot. We etch this out with a buffered hydrofluoric acid etch to make a pit. And then we apply appropriate voltages. We'll zoom in here and look at where the, uh, where the bearing is. Sort of the heart of this thing is, of course, this. We schematically, we're using a double wall tube, but in practice, we have more walls. And uh, as we zoom in here, we'll see these very strong covalent bonds on the outside. But here's the uh, van der Waals bonds, these, these weak forces between them. And now you have to compromise 
a row of bonds to get these things to loosen up, and this will sort of magically um, appear in color where these bonds are removed. That's with reactive ion etching or even mechanical uh, displacement can shear those bonds, and then this thing starts moving, and once those bonds are, have been shorn, uh, you get very low friction, and then you can rotate it around. You can stop it. You can rotate it in the other direction. You can manipulate this. So it's, it's, it's quite a bit of fun uh, to, to, to work on this, this little motor. To put it into perspective of the size, I show here the original uh, MEMS motor made by Professor Muller. And on the same size scale as our motor, there are actually four of them here. There's one right here another one here, another one here, and another one here. They're all independently operable, and they sit on this uh, silicon surface. And this is just wiring coming out. Now, you notice this wiring is very inefficient. I probably would not get a job at Intel as a, uh, you know, a chip designer because I'm just wasting so much real estate. But this was just a demonstration project, and these really are scaled down by orders of magnitude from nanoscale, from, from microscale into nanoscale. So that, that's, that's interesting. I'm using a hybrid now. I sort of used a new material and still sort of the uh, silicon technology of using electron beam lithography and, and silicon, and silicon oxide, and so on. So it's a hybrid of those two um, technologies, if you will. And the question was, could you go down even smaller? So this is maybe a few hundred nanometers in size. And I was interested in a motor even smaller, you know, at the atomic scale. And uh, that was a rotational motor, and the more I thought about this, the more I thought, well, maybe rotational motion is complicated. Let's go with linear motion. And, of course, many motors we're familiar with are linear motors. You, the, the piston engine in an automobile is a linear motor. The pistons go up and down. It's pretty easy to convert that to rotational motion with a crankshaft. Your bicycle, your legs pump up and down linearly, so that's a linear motor, and so on. And so the linear motors are relatively complicated, though. You, usually you have something like a cylinder and a piston, some working fluid. You've got a complicated valving. You might have steam or gasoline air mixtures that provide the pressure. And this has to go up, but then you have some reciprocation that has to go back down. And so it sounded really, really complicated. And we came up with all kinds of crazy ideas of making cylinders out of nanotubes and plugging them with nanocrystals. And then these things would move up and down with gases in there, and nothing really worked right. We decided to simplify things even more and not get so complicated and, and have nature help us and to put this entire motor into one nanocrystal, basically. Not get so complicated. So here is a nanocrystal. This is a, an ordered array of atoms. They're going to be, in this demonstration project, indium atoms. And the way we're going to make this motor move, we're going to have these lever arms come in that couple to the outside world, is we're going to grow this crystal. And we're going to take atom by atom and add it to this crystal and grow it. And as the crystal grows, it pushes things apart. It's like your hydraulic jack jacking up your car, and you pump in oil each time you move this. We're just going to add another atom to the bottom and push this thing up. So we need an atom reservoir. We need sort of tracks to move the atoms. And then we need this, this nanocrystal that we're going to grow atom by atom. And schematically, the way this would work, although this is maybe wishful thinking, is you just have a bunch of atoms scurrying around the bottom. You add them, and then you have to reverse this. Maybe you pull the atoms off again. So you need some way of controlling nanocrystal growth and deconstruction of a nanocrystal. You can grow nanocrystals in the laboratory, but it's hard to shrink them in a controlled way. But the idea was just keep it simple. And here is a picture in, in this transmission electron microscope, because that's how we can view the, the motor operating. We've got these two lever arms. Here's a carbon nanotube, another nanotube. We've got this reservoir. This is itself a crystal of indium, and we're going to use this as our source of atoms. And we're going to run electrical currents through these lever arms. And right where they touch, they're going to seed a crystal, and we'll grow this thing we call the ram, which is just a nanocrystal. And you see the crystal is growing a little bit, and it's got a divot in it in the reservoir. Here, we've grown this by say, 100 nanometers or more, and we've used up maybe half the, uh, the fuel, half of the uh, atoms. And then you'd reverse this, and all you have to do is reverse the current, and the ram deconstructs, and these lever arms go back together. And here's a picture of some data that are resulting just low voltages, one volt, plus or minus one volt, works really well, and you can have the ram uh, expand, shrink, shrinking here, expanding, shrinking, and so on. You can cycle as many times. There's no wear or fatigue 
because you're regrowing this ram each time. So if you know about material science and metal fatigue, this does not play a role at all because the atoms don't wear out. You know, an indium atom, you can use it many times, it doesn't get tired, and you're regrowing the crystal from scratch each time. This is relatively slow. This is maybe a minute or so when we were doing that just to um, take a lot of images, but it can be very fast. You can grow this so fast that it's faster than our video rate in our um, CCD camera. And so it's, it's a very fast um, uh, motor. One question is how powerful is this motor? You know, it's, it's small, which is nice, but uh, how does it compare to other motors? Well, there are a lot of nanoscale motors in existence already. Your, your muscles in your arm are biomotors, very small linear motors that are quite efficient. They have uh, you know, relatively small forces, but you gang them together. You have millions of those motors working uh, together, and you can get macroscopic forces out of that. The power density is what I want to look at here, and it's about 0 0.05 gigawatts per meter cube. That's how much power a biomotor can generate, roughly. Then you take a look at a macroscopic motor, and I've got a BMW 740i engine. It has about four liters of displacement, so I'll say it's about that size. And if you do the calculation, you find that that automobile engine has exactly the same uh, power density as a biomotor. Completely different technology, completely different size scale, but the same power density. Um, I now realize that this is probably uh, wishful thinking, considering faculty uh, salary cuts and so on. So I should, I should use a more appropriate vehicle, maybe a, an old Geo Metro or something like that. <laughs> okay, so, um, but this nanocrystal that, we, uh, that we're uh, using, this motor, has orders of magnitude higher power density. It's incredibly powerful for its size. And so, you know, people have criticized this and say, what are you going to do with this nanomotor, drive a nano car around? And I say, well, <laughs> Um, you know, what are you going to do with a single biomotor? Not much, but your, your muscles work pretty well because you have them ganged together, and, and we can gang these together and have incredible power densities where maybe something the size of your thumb powers a train or your automobile or so. So that, that's, uh, you know, kind of a provocative thought. What I'd like to do since we're talking about motors and converting energy to, to work is, is um, look a little more broadly and say, well, you know, uh, are there other ways to do this, and perhaps more efficiently or more directly? And we know about fossil fuels being converted via engines to mechanical work. That's how our transportation system operates. And we know about sunlight, and there are a lot of efforts at Berkeley to have sunlight more directly convert things to, to energy. Of course, sunlight generated the fossil fuels long ago. So sunlight can, can grow various biofuels. They run an engine, and you get mechanical work. Uh, reservoirs, hydroelectric already uses sunlight. Sunlight causes evaporation, rain, water in high elevation reservoirs. Use that to run turbines, get electricity, distribute that, do work, and so on. Photovoltaics may be more direct, but you still generate electricity than you need an electric motor to do work. And you have nuclear fuel that also has various kinds of intermediates. So the question is, can we have a more direct conversion from sunlight into mechanical work? You shine light on something and it just moves without having chemical fuels and intermediates, without electric motors, anything like that. And so we might gain some understanding by, by looking at the natural world and see if maybe scaling can help us here. And if you've ever looked at small insects like ants, you know, they're very small, but for their size, they're incredibly powerful. Ants have no problem carrying things that are many times their body weight around. And this is because of sort of scaling laws of how muscle forces scale via gravitational forces. And the smaller you make something, the more powerful you get, relatively speaking. And so not, not too many humans can carry their own body weight above their head, at least not you know, several times their body weight. And, um, and that's because of the scaling idea. It also works with surface tension. You see these, these uh, animals like uh, water striders jumping across water. and um, uh, that's because surface tension starts playing a dominant role, and it beats out gravity. Surface tension is, is stronger than the gravitational force, and in fact, you win even quick, more quickly for this force. It goes as 1 over L squared, where L is the size of your system. And so, you know, most humans cannot walk across water because they are just too, too large, but these, uh, these small insects can do it rather nicely. So I'm going to sort of key in on surface tension. Surface tension is an incredibly powerful force that if you could tap it, it, it um, it could be incredibly useful. 
So we're going to try to use surface tension to move something along. And the idea is the following, that surface tension on the surface of liquids is very temperature dependent. And you can lower the surface tension by uh, heating the, the liquid up. And so if you had a system where you locally heated it up, then the surface tension that's stronger on the other side could propel this object to the right. So we need something that's absorbing light and converting light to heat. And then that heat is efficiently transferred to the liquid locally, though. You don't want to heat up the whole liquid, or else you, you haven't gained anything. So what we're going to do is take these carbon nanotubes again, which turn out to be the blackest material known. If you measure the optical properties of nanotubes, the absorption spectrum, they absorb light better than any other material that's, that's been made. They're, they're really highly efficient absorbers. So that's great. And we're going to convert that sunlight energy into heat very directly. So we, we grow these things. We call them carbon nanotube forests. This is a scanning electron microscope image. And these uh, forests are uh, maybe uh, 100 microns high, but nanoscale in diameter. And we grow them across a, a large wafer. And this combination of texturing and very dark material is, is just what we want for absorbing the light. That's what makes us very efficient. And then we're going to connect that forest onto some uh, a polymer material that has, doesn't absorb light very efficiently, but has just the right density. So it, it floats on, on various liquids, including water. And so we are going to make something we call a boat. This is in collaboration with Professor Jean Fourche in chemistry, who's a polymer chemist. And this is our boat. It's just a little shoebox shaped object with these uh, carbon nanotubes on one end. And as you can tell, we didn't graduate with uh, degrees in naval architecture. And so this is not exactly a very efficient boat design, but it's to, just to, uh, to demonstrate this. So it's macroscopic, but we've got these nanoscale interactions going on right there. So we put this thing in a trough. We shine some light on it, and the thing just zips across. It's actually pretty fast. This is a one centimeter scale. And it works with uh, seawater. I had my graduate students just go to the bay and get some seawater. And the bay water, as you know, is not exactly the cleanest salt water. They wanted to use highly distilled water. And I said, just go to the bay and get some stuff and see if it works. It works great with, uh, with salt water. And uh, it, it's really quite, um, quite easy to, to do this. And it, it moves very quickly. And the, another thing is, you see it moves a little bit. We actually were um, driving this with light focused on one side or the other. And in principle, you can get control out of this very simply because you just uh, shine the light on one side or the other side, you can block the, the light, and you get immediate uh, rudder control on this, which is very hard to do of objects around this size. So uh, directional control is, is coming right out of this. So that's a, a very nice application of this, of sort of converting sunlight to work um, without too many intermediates. It is, of course, absorbing the light, converting it to heat, making use of surface tension. But there are no intermediate fuels and, uh, and no complicated uh, processes. So the last thing I wanted to, to touch on is a radio technology. And, and it's, a, it's, you know, it's a technology that we use every day with our communications, as you know. And it's, it's not really that old. It's about 100 years old. Here's Marconi with his spark gap uh, radio. And um, there were some significant advances in radio technology. And I think it's important to, to point those out. One is that understanding electromagnetic theory the physics of electromagnetism, which happened in the late 1800s, was essential for Marconi to, to make these, these radio transmitters and receivers. And then quantum mechanics came along in the 1920s, which allowed us to develop radio technology to small scale, to make use of semiconducting materials using quantum mechanical processes. And so these tube radios of the 1920s got scaled down in the 19. Uh, 40s, late 40s, 1950s, to the transistor radio. And that was a phenomenal breakthrough. It's something you could just carry in your hand. And before that, you had something that had to be plugged in the wall that was you know, pretty large, not really portable. And then another transition occurred in integration. And so going from this transistor radio, if you've ever seen one of these old transistor radios, you open it up, and somebody's by hand soldered in these individual components of transistors and resistors and so on. And it's just it's a very cumbersome architecture. But going to integrated circuits allows all these nice, fancy things that we use now and sort of take for granted. And so this is a, an interesting uh, lesson 
that you need to understand the theory of, of the materials and the phenomena. You need to maybe go to new materials from you know, spark gap metals. And then integration becomes equally important. And so our goal was to make a really small radio receiver, basically one at the nanoscale. And how could you do that? And the first approach we used was, well, let's you know, look at how a radio works, break it up into its basic components, and then build those components one by one at the nanoscale and put them together in an appropriate architecture. And that's kind of the uh, pedestrian way of doing it and thinking about it, but that's what we tried. And just coming up with some nanoscale things, the antenna, well, it's not obvious that your antenna should be really small if you're trying to receive commercial radio broadcasts. If you know something about antenna theory, you try to match the size of your antenna to the wavelength of the radiation. But we can make a small antenna just out of a nanotube, you know, sticking out of something, maybe a few microns long. And then tuners, there are ways to make electromagnetic tuners out of nanoscale objects. And we had done that. We had made various oscillators and tuners um, that, that worked at the nanoscale. And amplifiers, uh, using nanowires or nanotubes, you can make field effect transistors, very similar to standard MOSFETs that are used in the industry today, but they're, they're smaller. And they work quite well. And if you configure them properly, you can make amplifiers. And then a demodulator to strip off the, uh, the coded information you need some nonlinear element, something like a diode. And we had discovered that by putting appropriate defects instead of hexagons, by putting some pentagons and heptagons into a nanotube, this would behave as a uh, shot key barrier material with nonlinear IV characteristics. And it looked like a diode, and that could be used as a demodulator. So we've got an antenna, a tuner to tune in the right radio station. We amplify this up, and we demodulate. And so we could put this all together. And that was the challenge. And we tried, and we ran into some problems. And after thinking about this, I decided that this approach, while pretty straightforward, was just not, not very smart. In fact, it kind of uh, defeated the purpose where we'd be taking nanoscale objects and connecting them with microscale interconnects. And we'd be sort of forcing, you know, it'd look, it'd look like a regular chip, except there'd be nanoscale objects wired together. And that wasn't really the, um, the goal of this. It was to have an integrated system that was very small. So we decided maybe mechanical oscillations, mechanical motion was the way to go. And this is counterintuitive. If you're going to do something really, really small and you're trying to have an electronic system like a radio, it seems the last thing you would do is introduce mechanical motion. It's like your calculator and you want to make a smaller calculator and you say, well, let's have um, you know, gears and sliding beads. You're back to the abacus uh, days. And that just doesn't seem very smart. But Let's take a look at it anyway. If you have a mechanical oscillator, and here's a diving board, and here's a little girl, she's jumping off this. The diving board is maybe a, a few meters in size, and its oscillation frequency is maybe a few hertz. You can just barely hear a diving board if it's bouncing up and down. And if you make this smaller, of course, the frequency goes up. The frequency of the oscillation, the mechanical oscillation, scales as for one over the, the length of the oscillator. And we all know about musical instruments, xylophones and things. These are higher notes than these just from the size of this. And you get around the audio frequencies. That's why musical instruments are around that size. You can hear these things. And people had made nano cantilevers or micro cantilevers much smaller. And indeed, the frequencies scale very nicely. And you get around uh, a million hertz or megahertz, which is starting to get in the radio frequency regime by making these, these small, looks like a harp, really, with um, silicon or silicon nitride um, vibration uh, reeds. Well, we already have very small uh, systems, these carbon nanotubes. And if you just have a free nanotube at this end, and it's mounted onto something else, and you twang it, this thing will oscillate. And fortuitously, the oscillation frequencies are around a megahertz to a few gigahertz. That's exactly what you want for commercial radio communications. So we've already got a really nice cantilever. It's oscillating in the right frequency range. So maybe we could uh, use that as part of this radio. And so instead of uh, trying to wire a bunch of different things together, the idea is, why don't you make the entire radio out of just this one molecular structure, this one nanotube? It's one molecule. And uh, if you've got just one molecule and you want to wire it up, you don't have much choice. So it's easy to do. It's conceptually easy. You connect it to a wire. And then the other end, 
you have an electrode nearby. You don't solder onto this end completely. We, we have a little gap here, so this thing can be free to move mechanically up and down. And then the one other component we're going to add is a battery to power the thing. And we just connect a battery here, and it charges this up. So this gets charged up negatively and positively. And I claim that's the entire radio. Okay, you don't need anything else. You've got all those components built into this one molecule. So let's see how that might work. First of all, you need an antenna. And um, we've got an antenna. It's a mechanical antenna. It's not an antenna in the usual electrical sense, where electric field is accelerating charges up and down the antenna. But the antenna is charged at its tip. The electric field that's oscillating, this is the carrier wave of your transmitted radio signal. It's coming along. It tickles this thing. This is an electric field pointing up and down, polarized in that way. And it's going to tickle this. And if that frequency matches that, it's going to start oscillating. Okay, so it's picking up the signal. That's your antenna. And in fact, that is automatically your tuner because the mechanical resonance frequency of this has to match this carrier frequency or else nothing will happen. And so you'll only pick up the radio station that is tuned to this mechanical frequency. So it's selecting that particular mechanical frequency for this system, lock matching it to the radio signal frequency. So we've got the antenna and tuner built. They're, they're the same. Now we need to amplify the signal. We need to have some transducer amplifier and people are so caught up with transistors, and so was I, that whenever I thought of making a transistor amplifier, or an amplifier, I thought of transistors, solid state transistors, MOSFETs, CMOS, all that kind of stuff. And maybe you should take a step back and say, wait a minute, how did people amplify signals before solid state transistors? And you had vacuum tubes around, and vacuum tubes worked pretty well. There might even be people in this room who still have vacuum tube amplifiers at home. They, they work quite nicely. Some people prefer them. They think they sound better than solid state amplifiers. And the way a vacuum tube amplifier works is it uses quantum mechanical field emission. You have a high voltage, high electric field on this side, and it spews out electrons. And these electrons tunnel off onto this electrode. And that helps you amplify the signal. So vacuum tubes, you usually turn them on. They have to get hot. They glow. That's to have the electrons jump off more easily. And then the electrons tunneling off give you amplification. And so we're just going to go into the mode where we crank up the voltage high enough so we get electrons spewing off this while it's vibrating. We use this field emission, and that amplifies the signal. <coughs> now, if you do the analysis, in fact, that nonlinearity of that tunneling process folded into the, the current going through here automatically gives you this demodulation function. It's demodulation for free basically, because the field emission is nonlinear and it depends on the position here. So when this is up, it doesn't field emit as much as when it's there. And that's a nonlinear process, nonlinear tunneling, and it gives you demodulation. So you strip off the signal. So we've got everything. We've got the antenna, the tuner, the amplifier, and the demodulator all built into the same small nanoscale structure. So now we still need to tune the frequency, right? It's kind of boring. You've got just one radio station. You know, your parents tell you what that station is and you can't change it. Um, and so you look at musical instruments and, and um, if there's some students here who recognize this person, I've got some advice for you. It's time to graduate. Move on. Okay. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is somebody from, from old school. So uh, this person is, is playing a lot of uh, interesting guitar tunes. And, of course, uh, for these musical instruments, it's pretty easy to, to change the frequency, the resonant frequency. And what you can do is just change the length of the guitar, guitar string. And so if we wanted to change the mechanical resonance frequency of our radio, in principle, we could just cut off the nanotube and make it shorter, and then it would vibrate faster. And this is, uh, unfortunately, an irreversible process, but it's not hard to do. The way we do it is we just run such a big field emission current off the end that it, it boils off carbon atoms and we can monitor this in real time, and we can stop when this has the right frequency. And for us, this is a way of getting uh, the radio into the right band. Into, you know, you want a gigahertz radio, you want a megahertz radio, you want a kilohertz radio. You would just shorten the tube and stop, and then you have the radio operating in the right band. But you still need a way to fine tune the different radio stations in, within that band. And the way we do that is the way you fine tune a guitar. You just play with the tension on the string, and if the tension is a little higher, the string will vibrate at a higher frequency, even though the length is fixed. 
And so we do that, and we just play with the one knob we've got, and that's the electric field on here. And a higher electric field tensions this, this electric, these electric field lines pull on this nanotube, and they change the tension and they change the vibrational frequency. And you see here we're changing with the bias voltage and changing the uh, frequency from uh, you know, uh, a few tens of megahertz, 70 megahertz, uh, and so on. We can scan through different frequencies. So that all works. And the output to listen to this, all you need is to listen to the field emission current. You put a sensitive ammeter here or an earphone. You know, take your iPod earphone, plug it into this, and then you can listen to this without any other electronics. All you need is a power source and an earphone, and that's it. So because this radio is mechanical in nature, that's really a new way of building a radio, you can watch it operate. And uh, normally I don't think of putting radios into microscopes and watching them when they're operating. It seems kind of boring. But this one will start vibrating. And so this is, again, in this high-resolution transmission electron microscope, you've got this nanotube. And there is a radio station broadcasting nearby, but the frequency doesn't match. And what we're going to do is tune this by changing the tension a little bit, and then suddenly it, it locks in and is vibrating vigorously. And uh, I might as well uh, play this for you so you can see it, but uh, the fun thing is to, um, to hear it at the same time. So let me do this. This is, again, uh, this is going to be a real-time image. You're going to see a video. And this is a radio right here. Actually, there are two radios. Here's another one. But this one's going to operate at much higher frequencies. This is a gigahertz one, and this one's in the megahertz. So we're going to operate this as just conventional megahertz, around 100 megahertz or so. And uh, it's going to pick up, and, and let's see what, it, see what it does. So we're playing with the tension right now to try to lock on the different station, and so it just unlocks from that because the, the resonance is now changing. And so if you want another station, let's say you don't like this kind of uh, rock and roll stuff and you want to have, you know, soft or classical, you uh, turn into this station. This is um, uh, from this opera, Largo, uh, uh, from Ziri's by, by Handel. And the interesting thing is that song was actually the very first song ever transmitted by, by radio in 1906. And you might think it was a little scratchy here, but when they first transmitted it, nobody knew what they were transmitting. They said, what was that? It was just a bunch of noise. The noise you heard here is, because it's an atomic scale radio, it's actually atoms jumping onto the radio and jumping off and landing near the tip and influencing the field emission. Uh, there's no filtering going on here at all. Modern radios all have filter systems, so you can clean this up pretty quickly. You could even go to digital, like Morse code, and then it'd be absolutely clean. Um, and uh, you could also operate this with less environmental atoms around, and then it'd be much cleaner. And people say, oh, it sounds kind of scratchy. And I say, why don't you give me a break? I mean, this is one molecule. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, try to do better. So uh, I think it works pretty well for being that size. So let me, let me finish up and just say, you know, there are challenges. Uh, if you're really trying to compete with existing technologies, you know, there are always cost effectiveness and uh, scale up issues. Also, existing technologies have huge inertia. So if you're trying to fight Intel or a Motorola or something, you'd better have a very clever way of going around that technology or mating with it so that these people don't feel threatened. And also, there's a lot of uh, concern about nanomaterials. And Berkeley is a nano-free zone, so I guess you can only use a nano radio on campus and not in uh, downtown Berkeley. But I think the Berkeley City Council forgets that uh, people have many nanoparticles in them. And uh, if we're going to ban 
uh, nanotechnology in Berkeley, we're going to have to ban all animals as well, all people, uh, including white paint and other common things that we're used to. So we have to uh, treat this carefully but not, get, uh, uh, not go overboard on it. So um, I hope you've been, enjoyed some of the uh, nanotechnology stuff we've been doing, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Um, did the nanotubes ever snap off when you were tuning in the resins? Uh, the nanotubes are um, extremely resilient, and so you can uh, flop them back and forth to extreme amplitudes, and they, they never break. They don't seem to fatigue. Uh, we can't tear them. We just grab them and, and, and break them and so on. But they, uh, we have never seen them break because of uh, vibrations. For the uh, nanocrystal motor, when... Where exactly is the are the is the voltage being applied? Is it the two uh, the two? It's the two um, lever arms that come yeah. in. We run a current through that. So the nano crystal, as it grows, is actually conducting the electrical current. Okay. And that's why we use metal atoms. So we grow a metallic nano crystal, not a, an insulating one. The uh, the process by which the atoms move on these tracks or on these levers is through electromigration. So we're using the electric field and electric current to strip atoms off of the reservoir, scurry them along. It's really a very controlled electromigration, and then putting them where the, the crystal is seated. Okay. So it's current through uh, the macroscopic loop, through the lever arms. Thank you. How do you control the diameter of that crystal as it grows? The diameter is something we have not um, uh, directly controlled, but it turns out that the the way the facets or the, the, uh, the crystal structure on the nanotube itself and the way those things are aligned, they seem to dictate the size of the crystal. So the crystal grows to roughly the diameter of the nanotube. It, it doesn't spread out this way and it grows linearly. And we have some models for that of you know, what's the most favorable position for new atoms to go near the interface between the crystal and the nanotube. But we, don't, we didn't initially try to control that. It seems self-limited by the geometry of the, of the tube. Um, is it possible to make transmitters with nanotube? Uh, yeah, so we have uh, made those, and it's, um, it's a little trickier. Uh, what we wanted to do is to make a, a transmitter where we didn't have to feed in an RF signal for the oscillation, because that doesn't seem, you know, then you need a, you need a big signal generator. And so the, the key was to have um, self-oscillations induced under appropriate conditions. And that, that happens. So we can set this up and under appropriate conditions where there, the nonlinearities amplify intrinsic noise in this and you have a sort of a white spectrum of, of um, frequencies dumping in just from thermal noise. By the way, that radio was all operating at, at room temperature and so on. And so um, you have self oscillations and then you put a signal on that and it transmits out. The, the problem is, of course, this is small, and so the transmitted power is not going to be huge. You'd have to phase a lot of these together to get macroscopic power to transmit over many kilometers. But uh, it does work in reverse. What happens when you try to scale up that um, nano boat and you uh, make a big one and you just dump it in the bay and you could, you could just sort of put, uh, I think you said uh, you could just put some cardboard or one side or the other yeah. and you could steer it. I mean, it sounds like something you, you could actually just go build and, and try it out. Uh, have, you, have you done that? And, and does it, does it, it sounds like the wake might draw water away from the back end. It might be yeah, sort of self-limiting. Yeah, there's issues of that. Um, we've made them, you know, this size, maybe a, a foot or something, and they, they work quite well. And we put them in the pond by uh, the, uh, the Hearst Mining Circle. <laughs> they scurry around with just sunlight. Uh, the, uh, the key to keeping it really highly efficient or powerful for its size is to make appropriate arrays so you don't have something just on the back of the boat because you have a limited amount of um, you know, line tension there. And so you'd want to make an array of these so you, you take advantage of the entire hull volume or hull area. And so that requires some additional engineering of, of making appropriate arrays. And they'd probably be uh, short enough so you could still, uh, so you'd have, you know, very powerful, 
for its size, but far enough away so you don't run into temperature gradient problems. You still need to maintain local temperature gradients. And so it's a, it's a great question. That's what you'd want to do to make this, you know, viable, or it, at it, least it, to study that. It sounds completely feasible for a bunch of high school students to just sort of make a big boat and sail it to San Francisco this way. Um, <laughs> it, it is not um, complicated technology to, to try to scale this up. I agree. It's pretty straightforward, and, and uh, I think people should look at it. Uh, you, you're limited by, you know, how much area you want to collect. And, and, and so on a ship, you know, is there enough sunlight on a ship, or do you need the ship to have bigger collectors or something? And, and uh, you can get reasonable power up from the, the typical size of a boat to, to power something if it's, if it's efficient. If I understood correctly, um, you tune the nanotube radio by field emission of the carbon atoms from the tip. Does that imply you can only tune it in, in one direction? Uh, we we uh, tune it by changing the strength of the electric field, which is pulling on the, the free end of the tube. And so we, we simply change the voltage that's on the, on the radio. And by increasing the voltage, you increase the, the frequency because the tension is higher. Um, simultaneously, you increase the total field emission current, but you, um, you're not necessarily hearing that. You're hearing a demodulated signal. And so, um, you know, that, that's, uh, uh, both things are coupled together. We've got a limited number of knobs on this, and um, intentionally so. We didn't want a complicated system. So basically, the only, we've only got two wires going to the system, so we change the voltage on it, and that's it. And that tunes the radio. Thanks. Last question. Yeah, just, just uh, what, do you have any idea what the what the efficiency of the little boats are? Um, we have not evaluated the total efficiency in terms of um, uh, you know how much of the sunlight is being converted to to work. We've made some estimates and it seems pretty good, but we um, we have to do you know, additional studies on that, especially for reasonable geometries. And you, these were. Um, sort of indirect measurements. In other words, we, to determine what the force was on the, on the boat, we didn't have it hooked up to a force meter to see how much power it's generating. We just watched how fast it was moving, and then you use standard hydrodynamic equations to convert speed to what sort of power was being generated. And, and, and so that's why the estimates are you know, um, crude right now, but, but we, we are doing those measurements right now, trying to be more quantitative about it. Great, thank you.